My name is Bob Amar. I'm an independent school teacher in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm very pleased to be here with you tonight talking about calculus. Uh, this is a topic that's aimed square, it's squarely in the, uh, in the pure, uh, purview of calculus AB, but it's also on the BC exam. So for those of you who are in BC, you're not totally wasting your time. Um, there won't be any BC specific topics on this, but this would still be a pretty good review for you. Come talk to us in the way that makes the most sense to you and that uh, is compatible with whatever you're, you happen to be doing. We are there for you. So today, we're going to finish off by looking at a particular kind of question that shows up on the AP exam a lot. I mean, who knows with this new format, but it's certainly possible that you'll get a table as a stimulus for one of those questions. Uh, we'll work with some tables. We'll dive in. It's, this is basically just a bunch of free response questions I've picked from the past. Uh, I've tried to stay away from the super most recent ones because I know Ms. Dunry has been doing those in the 4 p.m. stream. Uh, is it four? Three? The, or the afternoon stream. Uh, they've been doing uh, going over FRQs. So um, I've tried to pick some, some ones that are more ancient history and show you some of the different ways that they've constructed uh, questions involving tables. The tables themselves are very different, okay? But they all have one, generally have one major thing in common. And we're going to, we're going to talk about that uh, and we'll dive right in. Okay, so if you are ready, then the my my lovely picture is hiding the word equal in that right Riemann sum business. I think hopefully this is the only slide where that that becomes an issue. Okay, so let's let's get this started with a warm up. These are all pretty. Um, these can all be answered pretty much verbally except for D. Okay. So uh, I'm going to give you about a one minute head start. Okay. So I'm gonna make sure everyone can clearly see the values in the table. There's a lot of white space in that table that probably doesn't need to be there. But all right, let's go. Let's go from let's go from top to bottom. Can you conclude that F has a relative maximum at x equals four? Toss some answers in the chat, yes or no. And then if you want to hazard an explanation, we can do that too. Um so in part A, the most, um, yeah, so you, you definitely see a critical point at x equals 4. Uh, well, a critical number, a candidate for a relative extreme. What you don't see is what's happening near x equals 4. It's entirely possible that at x equals 3, it actually goes to a relative max and then makes its way back down through. Okay. There's there's lots of stuff that could be going on between the uh, between the various uh, values. Okay, so what so what you expect to be happening on this function is something nice and not, something nice and gentle, right? You expect um, it's first mostly first quadrant. I think is what I worried about. Now two four six eight, and so what you're kind of thinking you're seeing here is that, and then it goes up to two and goes back down to negative four. Okay. Those are the things that you know are happening for sure. But what you don't know is everything else that's happening. Here's, here's one function that fits that. Here's another function that fits that. There's lots of things that could be happening between. And without more information, you don't actually know. So you can't conclude that f has a relative maximum at x equals 4. Because you don't know what's happening. And I haven't given you enough information. There are other ways, there are other things I could tell you that would let you make that conclusion. For example, if I told you something about the second derivative on the same interval, you might be able to use the second derivative test. So even though you want to use the first derivative test, you don't have quite enough information to use it given just this information. Look at part B. Can you conclude that f has an x-intercept on the interval 2, comma 8? Now, this one, this is a case where, OK, so in order to use the IVT, what has to be true about the function? OK, yeah, so somebody, somebody toss in the, in the chat what you're, when you say IVT, what is it that you mean? The intermediate 
value theorem. Some, which I think some of you learn in pre-cal, but is a really good theorem in calculus as well. Uh, the intermediate value theorem in this case applies. How do you know it applies? Someone has already said it, but I just want to. Good. So actually, just got the right. Uh, that's our that's our theorem there. Basically, if the function is continuous, then it has in order to get from one point to the other, it ha it can't just jump around, right? So the only way that for example, looking at this function, even though I don't know what's going on with a function, if I know the function's continuous, I know to get from x equals 2 to x equals 4, I know for sure it's got to cross the x-axis. Okay, And the, how do I know that the, it's important, and this is an important piece, how do I know the function's continuous? And someone has already said it. I just want other people to say it. Differentiability implies continuity. So this one was no, but this one is yes. Okay. F is continuous, or F is continuous since it is differentiable. And um, F of 2 is less than 0, which is less than F of 4. Uh, Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem is a is a conclusion about. It's not a conclusion about f. Rolle's theorem is a conclusion about f prime. Okay. Um. But the, so, so folks are asking about Rolle's theorem. I'm super glad you're asking about that because we're going to talk about part C now. Okay, so let me catch uh, let me catch squeeze theorem and IVT. All right, uh, the squeeze theorem talks about two functions having. So let's say I want to, let's say I want to establish some. Uh, let's say let's say I know the following. Okay, so I have two. I have two functions: a red function and a green function. We'll call the we'll call the green function um, call the green function g of x. And we'll call the red function h of x. Okay. So, all right. So, let me uh, emphasize what I'm doing here is the squeeze theorem. Okay. Now, I'm going to draw a function in rainbow color. I'm going to call it f. Okay. And oh, by the way, let me mark. Let me mark uh, this point here. I'm going to mark it with an open circle. It could be a closed circle, but um, so let's say that all. Let's say that all three of these functions share an open circle at um, say 4 comma 2. I haven't drawn the function yet. We'll say that this function is f of x. Okay. And I know that um, near x equals 4, g of x is less than f of, less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to h of x. Okay. Since the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x equals the limit as x approaches 4 of h of x, which equals 2. Sorry, there's lots of things going on here. Since Yeah. Okay. That's. I'm. I'm seeing it pretty clear. It's. I'm doing it all up here. Um, I can try to move it down. Can't move it down much more. Okay. Let me try to put some. Let me put some extra space. There. Let me put some extra. See if I can put some extra space there. Okay. All right. Since the limits. So I've, since I've gone, gone ahead and given myself a little more room, let me just move everything over. Nope. This video is just melting right now. Since the limits of G and H are both 2, the limit as X approaches 4 
of f of x is also t. Okay. H and G have to, they just have to have a, that, they just have to have that limit in a neighborhood around x equals four. So at some point, at some point, um, yeah, at some point they, um, they, they kind of do because otherwise they won't probably won't have a limit. Um, let's, let's pull, uh, let's, let's just look at the, um, let me pull up something real quick here. Um, do you want to, and you want to differentiate that from the, from the, the IBT. Okay. So as long as the limits exist, you don't even really, you don't even really need continuity, but it's almost, it's, it's almost certainly going to be the case that you have continuity, but as long as the limits exist, you don't really need continuity, but that's, that's not what the, that's different than the intermediate value theorem, the intermediate value theorem. Just says that, like for example, let's take the same point four comma two, and let's let's say that you have the point two comma negative two. Okay. Um, sorry, my camera keeps going out. I'm gonna have to. I, I'm working on fixing that, uh, but I can't fix it tonight. Uh, if f is continuous. F is continuous on two comma four, then F has to take every value from negative two to two. So the IVT talks about val actual values of F. But the squeeze theorem talks about just the little limit near a point. Okay. Um, IVT is a closed. Um, IVT is a closed interval. Most of these involve co continuity on a closed interval and differentiability on an open interval. Okay. Um, so we'll. I'll, I'll try to hit some of those particulars because we're going to see a lot of those theorems tonight. Okay. All right, so you can't really uh, you can't really apply Rolle's theorem to part B of this warm up, but you can apply it to part C, right? Because F is continuous and differentiable. Since f of six equals f of eight, right? So on six less than eight, there must be somewhere where f prime of x equals zero. And this is Rolle's theorem or mean value theorem. Because the average rate of change when on, on the interval six to eight is zero. Right? So f of eight minus f of six over eight minus six is equal to zero over two. So the average rate of change uh, has the average rate of change is zero. So there must be a place where the slope is zero. Yeah, my webcam is just freaking out right now. But it's um, but the interval is six to eight. Yeah. In fact, if you look at a lot of AP, uh, if you look at a lot of AP answer keys like scoring guidelines, they almost never use Rolle's theorem. They almost always use MVT. But Rolle's theorem is a special case of the mean value theorem. Right, because the um, the slope of a secant line from f six to f eight is zero, 
So that means that there's some place on there where the slope of the tangent line is also zero. Yes, you can absolutely use Rolle's theorem. Yeah, when in, in a case where the mean value theorem would have a slope, would give you a slope of secant of zero, you can 100% use Rolle's theorem as your explanation. It's full, full marks. Absolutely. Okay, approximate the value of the integral using a right Riemann sum with three equal intervals. Okay, so uh, no matter what this function looks like, I know um, from two to eight, I know, let me just get rid of all these, let me get rid of all these random functions. Okay. No matter what the, no matter what the function looks like, I know what the three rectangles are going to be. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether, let's just assume it's a really nice function just you know just for just for the heck of it right now but it doesn't matter because all that matters is the the function value so the green rectangles here are going to correspond to a right riemann sum for this integral right i guess these didn't go down far enough sorry it's too late now let me just let me let me munge the scale. Okay. There, now it's right. Okay. Okay, so the right the the approximate value for the right Riemann sum is going to be three, uh, is going to be the interval from two to four, then the interval from four to six, interval from six to eight. And so that that approximation is going to be f of four times two plus f of six times two plus f of eight times two. And the three equal intervals, those are each of these is the delta x or the width of the interval. And so for part d, you can write 2 times 2 uh, plus negative 4 times 2 plus negative 4 times 2 and stop. It does in this case, um, well, I think it's actually, I think it's actually negative 12. Check me on that. But uh, honestly, I would, especially on this exam, once you've shown this, once you've shown the schema for what you're doing and substituted the numbers, stop. Yeah. Okay, Callie, uh, one, one thing I could tell you is that in order, in order to conclude it's a relative max, I could tell you what the, I could tell you that the second derivative is negative on the interval two to six. Then you could use the second derivative test. Um, I could tell you that something like F is, F is, um, uh, increasing, uh, from two to four and decreasing from four to six. I guess I could tell you that, um, there's lots of stuff. There's lots of stuff going on. I could say that F prime is monotonically decreasing from two to six. That would that would tell you that it's a relative max. And that's a strong monotonic is a strong decrease, meaning it doesn't hang, it doesn't just hang around zero. It, go, it will pass through zero. So there's lots of fancy, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen a couple of cases where that happens. Uh, so they that that's the one play, that's the one situation where our advice to simplify does tend to fall apart. Okay, so let's talk about now that I've drawn all over my slides. Let's talk about uh, some. Let's talk about some some hints for dealing with um, for dealing with tables. Okay, the truth of the matter is tables can say just about anything, right? Tables can include derivatives of functions. They can, in, along with the function, they could be derivatives without the function. They could be um, they could have multiple functions. They could be something. They could be something else. Just read very carefully what the table provides. Okay. It is also important to read the problem stem. I know I skipped the middle bullet, but I'm going to come back to that. It is also important to read the problem stem because there may be another function that the problem is using that is not related to the table at all. Okay. When you're finding an average rate of change at some value, make sure that you use the smallest possible val the interval in that table that uses that value in the interior somewhere. Okay. 
I'll, I'll illustrate that. But if you're, if you want to find the average rate of change, like if you're in this problem here, you're back in this problem here. And I ask you to find the average rate of change at, of F at X equals five, you would want to make sure that you used four and you'd want to use four and six to find the, use this to find the average rate of change at X equals five. Don't use a bigger interval than that, or you won't get full credit. Okay. The smallest interval that contains that point on its, in generally on its interior. Okay. Yes. That's super important. Okay. There are some words that they tell you outside the table that let you draw conclusions about things inside the table. Look for words like continuous, differentiable, twice differentiable, increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down. Um, anything is fair game outside the table. But the one big caution about tables is that other than what you're told in the problem stem, you have no way of knowing what's going on at values of x that are not given in the table. Also, if it happens to be t, then same, same thing applies. If you were told it was twice differentiable everywhere, you could absolutely use IBT on f prime of x. Because then you know that f prime is continuous. So really, I think that's the big thing. Um, you can use the information that's given as much to your advantage as possible. But um, if, you, if it says, if it just says differentiable function, then you can assume, then you can assume that without conditions. If it, if it says differentiable on an interval, then that only applies to the interval. We're actually going to see a few cases like that. Okay, so I've got a bunch of FRQs. Let's see how many of these we get through in 30-ish minutes. There's a lot going on. I might start skipping parts that look redundant, okay? But the main thing I wanna show you is the wild, wacky, wonderful world of tables. So this is a table that only includes a, a value, like a T and just a function L, okay? And so concert tickets went on sale at noon and we're sold out within nine hours. And then L is twice differentiable on zero through nine, okay? On the interval zero through nine. And then these are the only values of T that you know. You do know that the function is continuous. So, so it doesn't just magically jump from 120 to 156 somewhere. It's not a step function. It's not a weird function. It's a smooth function. You just don't know if it has other twists and turns in it besides the ones that are, that are listed. Um, it kind of is a, it, it, it has some rate in rate out flavor, but we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll have to ask ourselves to, we're going to have to have to ask ourselves if this really is a rate in rate out problem. I don't think of it quite the same way. It doesn't have two rates that combine together to produce the net rate. Um, I think there's a lot of, like some of the contextual integration stuff is probably out of scope. But there's some, um, there's some, there, I, I don't think it's too hard to, I don't think it's too hard to work that in, but my guess is that they're probably not going to hit that. All the stuff that would have happened in, in unit, um, in the last unit for you guys, unit eight. I think that stuff is going to be out of scope. But there might, that doesn't mean that they won't walk you up to the point where, where that logic could apply. They could do a rate in, rate out, and then differentiate the rate in, rate out, and then ask you, ask you about concavity of a, of a graph or something. All right, use the data in the table to estimate the rate at which the number of people waiting in line was changing at 5.30 PM. In other words, when T is 5.5. Okay. Show the computations that lead to your answer. Okay, so the best way to estimate a rate, the best way to estimate an instantaneous rate of change is to use an average rate of change, right? 
And so when I do this, I'm going to try to find an average rate of change that I think will be a good estimate for t equals 5.5, for or the rate of change at t equals 5.5. Um, yeah, let me quickly address what a rate in rate out problem is. Uh, there, there are some problems that that talk about uh, a rate like two different functions, each of which represent rates. But one of the rates is the rate at which something is building up, and one of and the other rate is uh, is something that where the where the, the rate at which things are leaving. So a rate in rate problem, rate in rate out problem tells you the rate going in and the rate going out, and it wants to know what's accumulating. Right. So for the simplest example might be I'm pumping water into a tank at 10, um, 10 gallons per minute, but there's a leak in the tank that's causing water to drain out at four gallons per minute. So the net rate is six. It's the, the, the volume of water in the tank will be rising uh, at a net rate of six gallons per minute. And so that's what a rate in rate out problem is. And then the way we make them fun is to make the, make the rate going in a function and to make the rate going out a function. So like the hose is slowly being shut off. So the rate going in is 10 minus T. And the leak is getting bigger. <laughs> so, the, the, it, so then it's like four plus one eighth T squared. Is the is the rate at which it's leaving? So it's at one point it's six, but then it, then it's changing, and then as the as the rates cross over each other, that's where you get local maximums and minimums of water level. Okay. Okay. So meanwhile, back at average rate of change. Okay. The best estimate of uh, the number of people the rate at which the number of people waiting in line was changing. That looks to me like L prime of t. Right, and in fact, what I want is L prime of five point five. That appears to be what I want. The best estimate that we can get out of this table is an average rate of change, and we need to pick the smallest interval that contains x equals five point five. Using a larger interval will not net you full credit. And so L of seven minus L of four, that is uh, 150 minus 126 over three. I think that answer is eight. And then we probably want to indicate units of measure so that we get full credit. And since we're, since we're a difference in L is going to have units of people and a difference in T is going to have <laughs> you'll go, we, we actually, we actually talk about the L prime hospital in class pretty much all the time. I don't think there's any L prime hospital today. Mm. Okay, so th that's part A. Part B is a trapezoidal sum. We're kind of getting, um, during the first four hours that tickets were on sale, now we're kind of getting into the, into the weeds here. Um, the, the trapezoidal sum means you average, basically what you do is you average the two um the two function heights and then that and then you multiply by the length of the width of the interval so this this estimate the average number of people in line okay here's the other trick i'm actually estimating the average number of people waiting in line okay so what i need to do for part b and my my underlines are so terrible let me try it let me try a highlighter instead Okay, the average number of people waiting in line, I need to be careful because if I just did a trapezoidal sum, let's say that I just did this. Okay, so for part B, let's say that all I did was, let's say that all I did was the trapezoidal sum. Okay, so I'm going to estimate zero to four L of T dt. I'm going to just do the trapezoidal sum. So it's f of zero plus f of one over two. I always write it out. Um, I don't use the trapezoidal rule in this case because if you notice, like your book might have a trapezoidal rule thing in it. And if, you're, if it's in your textbook, your teacher might be compelled to teach it and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but in this case, the intervals are not equal. The trapezoidal rule works, works perfectly well when you are in charge of your own approximation. But if you're given this approximation, 
you can't use the you can't use the trapezoid rule on this because the widths are not the widths are not equal. Okay. So f of zero plus f of one over two. So this is one. This is half the sum of the bases times the height. Yep. Okay. And then once I put in the numbers, I can stop. Except, have I actually estimated the average number of people waiting in line if I do that? By the way, does everyone know why, why, why this like this is a one and this is a one, but that's a two? Is everyone comfortable with that? Yeah. If you, whatever your book calls the trapezoidal rule, it has to have equal intervals. Uh, I, that's why um, I never I never actually teach the trapezoidal rule in my class. Um, it's not that there's anything wrong with the trapezoidal rule. It's exactly what you should do. If you have, if you are in control of the function that you're estimating, but if all you have is table data that somebody else gave you, then you can't use the trapezoidal rule on it. Okay, and so everyone is putting in the chat exactly what I've missed here because it's an average value. Okay, it's one over b minus a times the integral. Okay, so if that's not included, then you are missing a key part. I think you'd get a fair amount of credit, but not certainly not full. We're forgetting the one fourth. If you do not use the 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 three sub intervals that are given in the problem, then you won't get the answer at all. Okay. Can Yeah, they won't they won't grade that, but I think you're right. I I feel like mathematically I should use an approximation sign on the first line at least and then I'll use an equal Thank you. Okay, um, can ev everyone can hear me except Eva, it looks like, right? I've had my own technical troubles with my cam, but I think my mic has been pretty steady. So hopefully, um, Eva, you might want to try rejoining. I hope that hope that hopefully that's worked out. I think we're, we're all melting the internet right now. Okay. My favorite part, uh, I think my favorite question on the whole presentation is about to happen. For part C, what is the fewest number of times at which L prime of T must equal zero? This is my favorite part of basically anything that we're doing here. Okay. I think it would probably, um, let's see. What is your first off? What's your instinct? Let's just let's just take that. Yeah, the fewest number of times. Okay. It looks like it. So from zero to three, it looks like it's increasing for sure. From th somewhere between three and four, it starts decreasing. So it starts to turn. This function is twice differentiable. So that every place, if the function is twice differentiable, every place that it, it has a relative extreme, the derivative has to be zero. So we're counting, we're actually just counting the number of relative extremes in this problem. Okay. And I see at least one somewhere between three and four another one somewhere between um let's see it, it could be at four like for example right and then there's got to be another place somewhere between seven and eight um okay so let's talk about let's talk about why the let's talk about uh what what the answer is so it looks like uh we it looks like we really should say three well i'm i'm the i am throwing spaghetti against the wall here I don't actually know where where the extremes are. So in this case, I can I can make an interpretation that fits my basically fits my view of the world. Right. So I know that there has to be a relative extreme, there has to be a max somewhere on zero to four. Right. In fact, here's a here is a here is a uh, here is a, a thing that might here's a thing that might do it for you. 
So let me let me move my writing for B down. If we need it again later, I'll I'll pull it up. Okay. Okay. Um. This is my favorite. This is my favorite uh, interpretation. Okay. So on. Um, let me let me make sure I'm make sure I'm doing this. Try make sure I feel good about this. Okay. For part C. Since the uh, since f of three is bigger than f of zero, um, there must be um, some c and f is and f is continue and f is differentiable. And thus continuous. On zero to t to three, right? There must be some c on uh, zero to three, for which f prime of three is bigger, or f prime of c. Is bigger than zero. Okay. Similarly, let's actually call this C one because I'm going to use the I'm going to use the mean value theorem. I'm going to use the mean value theorem three times basically. Similarly, there must there must um, be a C two on three to four where f prime of c2 is less than 0. One where f, un, OK. And then I, I'm not going to write it all out. This was, I hope they don't ask a problem like this, because the, the true justification, you technically want to use the, you definitely want to make the justification each time. But just for the, for the sake of brevity, a C3 on 4 comma 7, where F prime of C3 is bigger than 0, and a C4 on 7 to 9, where F prime of C4 is less than 0. Since F is twice differentiable, F prime is continuous. Okay. If F, if, all right, so if F of three is bigger than F of zero, there has to be, that means that from zero to three, the function has a like net increases. So there's got to be some place on the interval zero to three where F prime has, where F prime is positive someplace. Now, in the best possible case for this function, that's going to be that's going to be the truth everywhere on that interval, right? And so what I'm now going to do is so is apply the intermediate value theorem to f prime. Since it changes since there are since there are three sign changes, since there are at least three sign changes in F prime, the minimum number of horizontal tangents is three. You could you could make a sign chart if you if you made the Blythe assumption that three that three four and seven 
were actually the extrema, I guess you could make a sign chart. You'd just be kind of guessing. Um, you should, the, the sign chart alone is not going to do it. Okay. C is the most, probably the most technical, uh, is the most technical part of this free response. Okay. Of course, this, you didn't come here for, for existence theorems. You came here for tables. So I do want to move to some other table-based examples. Okay. But here is the one case where. I think it's useful to think like since f is twice differentiable, the IVD applies to f prime. This is like the one one thing that I where I think it's like really really cool that you can use this theorem in that way. Um, you you definitely got one point for the answer. Um, you could get partial credit for an analysis that was that was partial, but you would have to think about the signs in f in um, in f and the chain. You'd get. Um, you probably get two out of the three points for this if you use the sign chart, because it at least shows that you considered the signs, but you'd have to actually use one of the theorems for the analysis. Because you don't really know the values of the, diff of the derivatives. Okay, that's a, that's a lot of writing for one point. And I'm, I don't know whether they would have given you credit for, for lesser answers. For part D, part D is just a sim part D is just a simple integral. This this is just something you'd put in your calculator. I'm not even going to do it. Okay. All right. Well, the I think the answer is around 970. Answers around 973, if you must know. But part D is the part D might actually be the least interesting part of this problem. It's just an integral. I don't even know if they're going to ask that kind of question because of the omission of unit eight. Okay. It gets probably a little less intense from here, but I wanted to lead with that because I thought that was super important. Do I recommend going back and doing all past FRQ? That, that's a lot of FRQs. Um, the style in recent years has become a lot more problems that jump around to different things than, um, than they've been in the past. So I would say anything over the last five to seven years, you want to look at those. And I would look specifically for problems that involve different kinds of techniques. Like that problem involved an average rate of change, an average value, um, uh, uh, an existence theorem and, uh, and an accumulator. And you'll see, you'll see lots of problems that I think are like that. I think that's a good, I think those are good. Um, those are good problems to do. Okay. Um, to this, this second example, given that it's 949, this second example is so much like the first example in terms of the stimulus, except, um, the reason I picked this is that this is this this one is a rate in rate out r is the rate out w is the rate in and so this is a case where the table only contains values of the derivative okay but this is still the same this is still the same process okay um Now it says used to estimate the total amount of water removed from the tank. Um, that during the eight hours, like this is an S, this is an integral zero to eight of R of T dt, for example. And then you would use the inner, you would use the values in the table. Okay. This is not an average value of R. This is an actual accumulation of R. So I don't know how much of that you'll see. Okay. But R prime of two is just the same thing we did before. You you want to estimate. Um, R prime of two is approximately R of three minus R of one over um, three minus one. And then you'd substitute numbers. This problem is very similar. Part D is a really cool, part D is a really cool application of the intermediate value theorem. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I want to show you a couple of other ways that you might see 
um, tables presented. We're not going to do all parts of this from here on out, but I do want to show you some of the other kinds of tables that show up. I am going to run a little over because um, I don't want to just be like, oh, and here's a table, and here's a table, and here's a table. Hey, it's 10 o'clock. Um, I'm going to probably run this till about 10, 10, 10, 15. Okay, but I do because I do want to give you your money's worth. Your money's worth, as it were. Um, you'd have to go really far back for when they made the change. Like a, a B calculus didn't used to have L'Hospital's rule on it. So you will miss, you will, you will, um, like if you go back past 20, like before 2017, um, you won't see, you won't see L'Hospital's rule, uh, represented anywhere, but L'Hospital's rule is fair game. So. I would definitely use the most recent years as a guide for that, because I think there's at least one L'Hospital's problem on there. Um, yeah, we actually, we actually did number five BC Calc in 2019 in my class, in my act, like the, my real life class today that I teach. Um, amazing question. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's the best advice I can give you on that. Okay. Here, you are now given a little bit more information about what's going on between. You're actually told something about the values of the functions and something about the values of the derivatives. OK, so let's do at least part A and probably, um, probably part C. Because if you can do part C, you can do part B. Between 0 and 4, open, find all values of x at which f has a relative extremum. f has a relative extremum. The candidates are our critical numbers. I can spell candidates. Oh my god. There we go. The candidates are where f prime is equal to 0 or f prime doesn't exist. Okay. So the only places where f could have a relative extreme are here because of 0, and here, because of dME. If, a, if the value of the derivative exists and is non-zero, f certainly does not have a relative extreme at that point, because it's either in the process of moving up or moving down. Yeah. But those are, our possible, those are our possible things that are going on there. Okay. All right. There, notice that f prime of 3 is not 0, so I don't care about it. Um, so for f for for zero x four, then there is really only two candidates, and the first, the, the only one of those for which there is a sign change on f prime is the one at x equals two. Okay. And so the only thing you actually have to say is only at x equals two. Okay. And then. Um, f is continuous at x equals 2, because it's, you're told that in the problem stem. And f prime changes from positive to negative. So f has a relative max at x equals 2. Camera's freaking out. Right, and that's the that's it. That's the only answer for part A. Okay, so what's the relationship between part A and part C now? Okay. What's different about part C? I'm skipping part B. You can, uh, it's, it's a great question to ask. It's a great question. We already did a stream about graph using the graph of the derivative. All right. And so part C is our, our old friend, the second fundamental theorem of calculus. G prime of X is, and since the, you have a constant on the bottom and X on the top, we know that G prime of X equals F of X, and you have to say it. Like the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So now you would repeat the same 
analysis except using the f row instead of the f prime row okay so our candidates are x equals zero oh, sorry not x equals zero x equals one and x equals three since f prime i'm sorry since g prime or since f oh we'll just say f of x equals zero relative ma uh, min at x equals one since g prime changes from uh, negative to positive and a relative max at x equals three since g prime goes from positive to negative. And then to answer part D, you'd have to use G double prime, but that's just F prime. Okay. Um, the only place you would use F double prime in this case is almost certainly to graph the function. Okay, and um, again, my major focus here is on tables and not on graphing based on the derivative, but it's a wonderful question to, to use to test your skills. Um, I'm unsure that they would do that this year, but I guess it's technically on the table. You could, you could be asked the curve sketch based on this. Um, if as a general strategy, I would immediately start by laying out the values of F that were there. Um, and then using all the different pieces that I had been, that appeared to me in the table to try and at least get some some momentum going. So I know that F is an F is increasing um, from from uh, F is increasing from zero to two. In order for two to be in order for in order for it to go from positive to negative, but have the have the derivative not exist, it indicates that um, F has a sharp corner at X equals two. But not an asymptote because f is certainly defined there. Okay, so that's just some of my thinking about that. Uh, you would use f, pro f double prime to to fine tune concavity and things like that. Um, you can tell where the points of inflection are going to be too by look just looking at f double prime. Okay, that's a pretty involved question. Okay, I absolutely positively want to do at least. Um, I, I love this question because it has a related rates in it, but um, this is this is one where what you're what you're told is a velocity, and so you're told the derivative of position. In that case, okay. um, I, I definitely like this question a lot, um, but it uses a lot of the same uh, the same techniques. Okay. I think corners and cusps are, cusps are definitely fair game, for sure. Um, you may, I, I think in this new thing, because the, the questions, the first question might even be slightly longer than one of these, because these all of these stimuli are meant to be done in 15, like this is a 15 minute question. So I think the 25 minute question is actually gonna be slightly longer. They may give you a graph and ask you to do a bunch of other, other stuff to it. Um, they will definitely want you to know like that certainly a function that exhibits a corner at a point is not going to be differentiable there. I would watch that one. Um, I would look for one specifically on curve sketching. Uh, I don't know if I don't know if Brandon or Peter are in here and they can say whether we have a whether we have a curve sketching or, or um, a curve sketching one in there. Um, using the graph of a derivative will tell you about analyzing corners and cusps, but if you're looking specifically at curve sketching, um, then I would find a different one than that. I really think they are going to, to mix up the, the course concepts. 
which is why I really think you should use the last, just the last few years as your major guide. What I like about, so that's why I like questions like this, because here's a trapezoidal sum. And look, part D. Part D is a related rates question. Um, I, I'm uncertain whether I really want to do a related rates question here, because I think once you get used to the fact that this is an, this is an acceleration or, or velocity question, um, so if this is the velocity, the average acceleration of train A is going to be the average rate of it's going to be the average rate of change of velocity. So if you're doing this problem, you can estimate the average acceleration uh, purely by um, just uh, the average acceleration is just going to be um, v of 8 minus v of 2 over 8 minus 2. And you should probably use a. And the, the reason they use a is that there's this whole other train that's operating on a different velocity curve altogether that's not in the table. Big fun, right? So anyway, so there's lots of there's lots of things that are, are kind of like all in the same like the same the same things going on. Um, and this thing just in the guise of velocity and acceleration. Right? And I don't know how much they'll do with that, especially with the motion part going from like like acceleration to velocity or velocity to position because it requires integration. For BC folks, all that stuff's in play. Absolutely 100%. You should be able to do every part of this question. Okay, so this is another example of a table, um, but I will do all of this question because I think this, I think this is, I think this part's pretty valuable. The functions f and g are differentiable for all real numbers, and g is strictly increasing. What that tells you in, in, hidden, in no un, un, uncertain terms, but slightly hidden by vocabulary, is that g prime is bigger than 0 everywhere. Absolutely, yep. And that that's that's hidden that's hidden code. That's something that you gotta that's something we, you gotta get in there. Okay, sorry about the 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 lack of sync with the webcam. Um, got to I have to ditch the solution. It's not working, but um, it's probably only annoying me because I can because I just kind of see it out of the corner of my eye. All right, so um, h of x is a weird function. Okay. All right, so looking at these two things here, though. Um, F and G are differentiable for all real numbers. Therefore, I would expect the composition to be differentiable as well. So H of X is differentiable, continuous, since it's a composition of differentiable functions. Okay. So the first question, explain why there must be a value R between one and three so that h of r equals negative 5. And then part b is asking about why there must be a value c, such that h prime of c equals negative 5. And this is a beautiful illustration of the difference between two of the major existence theorems. Okay, If you're given information about h and asked to make a conclusion about h um, going without taking a derivative, if you're just using continuity, it has to be IVT. If you're being asked to make a judgment about the potential values of the derivative, then that's a mean value theorem question. OK. So for part A, it's basically saying, let's, th this can all basically be taken into account by, let's do, let's do one other piece of info, uh, another thing here. H prime of x, then, is equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x minus 0. And I'm just going to leave out the minus 0. Okay. So with this in mind, I can actually do the following. I can make one more column in this table. Okay. 
I'm going to actually, um, I'm just going to rewrite what's going on here. I can make one more column over here for h prime of x with f prime of g of x is g prime of x. Okay. And I'm going to need to do a little work here. All right. So I'm going to just fill in the table of the, for values that I, as I need them. So the first value I need is really x equals 1. And x equals 1, f of g of x, right? So it's equal to f of 2 minus 6. f of 2 is 9. And so navigating this table is going to give you a little bit of a headache. Um, that's, just, that's just the way it is, and some things will never change. But don't you believe it? OK, so f of 2 is 9. 9 minus 6 is 3. Okay. h prime of x, in this case, is um, here, and I'm going to box the values that I get. H prime of x is going to be f prime of 2, right? Because g of 1 is 2, um, times g prime of 1. Okay, f prime of 2 is 2, g prime of 1 is 5. So that value is going to be 10. I don't need it for part, I don't really need it for part, um, I don't need it for part A, but I do need it for part B. All right, so let's take a look at part B now. A very, a very similar thing happens. Um, when x is 3, g of x is 4. So this is going to be equal to f of 4 minus 6. And f of 4 minus 6 is negative 7. Now I can answer, I can now answer part A. Uh, but let me go ahead and while I'm, while I've got some momentum here, let me go ahead and do this part. So f prime, this is f prime of four times g prime of three, okay? f prime of four is uh, three, g prime of three is two. So this is uh, six. Did I get that right? No, I don't think that's right. Um, Okay, g prime of three is three, g is six. Well, let me, yeah, let me, let's, let's, let's run with that for a second. Okay. Um, right. Someone's got to, someone's got to help me out here because I, I, I need to, like, looking at that number kind of freaking out a little bit. Okay, so. Let um, maybe maybe I don't need it. Let it, let um, like, so let's start with let's start with part A. Okay. Um, since uh, since f of four is less than negative five, less than I'm sorry, h of four is less than I actually actually didn't need the derivatives. It's getting late. Okay. Uh, h of h of three is less than negative five, which is less than h of h of one, right? So that means there, that means that uh, there must be some r where h of r equals negative five by the intermediate value theorem. Okay. I did the derivatives. I didn't need to do the derivatives. I'm just one, I'm, I think I, my brain just shut off for a second. The mean value theorem is about the slope of the secant line. So that means that there must be some, the, the mean value theorem applies to that. So there has to be some place where, um, the, where the derivative is equal to the average rate of change. So the average rate of change of h is h of 3. Yeah, I didn't need the, sorry for the false alarm there. I didn't need the derivatives at all. H of, but I do, I, that was fun. Uh, H of three minus H of one is negative seven minus three over two, which is also negative five. And so there must, so H prime of C equals negative five somewhere on one less than C less than three by the mean value theorem. Okay. Part C is a chain rule question. Okay, so W is an accumulator. 
Um, this is another second fundamental theorem of quest, uh, question. W prime of X is equal to um, F of G of X times G prime of X by the second fundamental theorem calculus. Okay, so W prime of three is equal to F of G of three. G of three is four times G prime of three. Yeah, and F of four times G prime of three F of four is negative one. G prime of three is two. That's negative two. Okay. All right. Last piece here. If G inverse is if G inverse is the inverse function of G, right? An equation for the line tangent to the graph of the inverse function at x equals two. this I really don't need it okay so let's do part let's do part d up here yeah. the line tangent to the graph of g inverse of x that's going to be uh, if you want to use point slope form I think that's the easiest way to solve this problem so it's going to be y minus g inverse of 2 is equal to um, g inverse prime of 2 times x minus 2 Okay, so I can do g inverse of two, but I need to I need a theorem for g inverse prime. Okay, so remember what's going on here is that um, the that you since you're uh, since you're reflecting across x equals y, all that's going to happen is you're going to get a reciprocal relationship, but at the other value. Okay, so g inverse of two is um, g inverse of two. Since g of one is two, then g inverse of two is equal to one. So this is y minus one. Okay. Now we're halfway there, but we need the we need the theorem that someone has just put in the in the in the chat there. Okay. Um, for the for the slope. Okay. So what I want to do is find um the reciprocal of the slope at one okay so g inverse of two g inverse prime of two is equal to one over g prime of g inverse of two right okay so um one over g prime of which is one over g prime of one uh, G prime of one is five. So this number here should be one fifth. Okay. Um, this is not a case for uh, where I would try to use something like the, I, I wouldn't try to use a different form in this case. I think just stick to the, stick to the, the simplest form makes it, makes it a little easier. Okay. So in this presentation now you've seen um the frq right above the related you mean do you, do you want to go to this one or the the part before it this one the inflection point yeah or do you want to do do you want to do do you want to do the related rate one Callie, is that what you're asking? Do you want to do the related rate one? Okay. You know what? Yeah, let's let's end there. Um, I did, if you look at the slides, I did pick one more example, but it's another one of just, it's just different, it's just different stimuli. Um, I think they're fun. Um, but here, let's go ahead and talk about this one a little bit. Okay. The distance between train A, and so you you'd have to have read the whole read and, and understood the whole problem to know what's happening here. If train A is running back and forth on an east-west 
section of railroad track. And you can see then that a positive value um, at time t equals two, the position, is the, the train is moving to the east. So we're assuming that positive, um, that positive values of the velocity and positive values of the position are to the right. Okay, so uh, train A's position is 300 meters east of the origin station. Okay, at time t equals two. So you actually need that part. Part B says, or her train B, um, it, or part D would say that uh, that train B is 400 meters north of the station. And we want to know the rate at which the distance between train A and train B is changing. Right? And so this is D. Right? And so let's, let's call this, um, let's call this distance A and let's call this distance C. So I'm going to make everybody really angry by writing a really strange version of the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> and so if we implicitly differentiate this with respect to time, we get um, 2a dA dt plus 2b dD dt equals um, 2d dD. <laughs> I love that, dt. OK, but dA dt is just the velocity of the train. I'm actually going to divide the whole thing by 2. And now I can substitute in the numbers that I got. Okay. And in this case, I happen to know that at this instant, this is only true at t equals two. Those numbers are changing. So they will never, they, the, what's, what's happening is that these are not always going to be the case. Okay. So this tells me that 300 VA of two plus 400 VB of two is equal to 500 um, DD DT. So dd dt is equal to, I could also divide through by 300 as well. That's, that would not be an issue. And so that tells me that the velocity of two, that's in the table. So that's um, 300 times 100. Okay. And then the velocity of two, I'd actually have to substitute into this function. And that is um, negative 20 plus 120, which is 100 plus, which is uh, 125 times 400 over 500. And then I can just stop. And then the, the rate in meters, and this is in meters per minute. It's, very, it's a very weird problem, but that's, that's, what the, that's what's happening with that one. Yeah, that one is, I think, I think that one is, um, it's, it's not necessary to show the units in the work. You can just do it at the end. As long as you feel confident that like you're not missing some conversion factor in the work that you do, you can just stick the units on at the end. I, don't, I, I am hard pressed to remember seeing any kind of free response where a unit conversion got in your way. And so you've seen a bunch of different kinds of tables, but I feel like um, I feel like this is one style of table that's super important. Um, the one that, that's on the screen right now where you see the different values of f and g, and then they ask you about the inverse, or they ask you to, to, to compare the derivatives of other things. Another thing you could see here is that h is defined as the product of f and g. So um, then you'd have to use the, the product rule and then use the values in the table that way. That's a very common. Uh, that's a very common thing that happens here. It turns out that I didn't. It turns out I didn't need any of this. It's not that it's wrong. It's just unnecessary. Um, but I did need everything else for this one. There's a lot of there's a lot of IVT and MVT on here, and I think one of the reasons they love intermediate value theorem and mean value theorem here is because you don't have a lot of information about what happens with the function between the points that are given. But the intermediate value theorem and mean value theorem, excuse me. That's those, they're made for this kind of situation where you have incomplete information. And so that's, that's a very frequent topic of discussion. Um, those existence theorems pop up again. And um, 
occasionally there's a curve sketching thing, but it's a, like this that that's that's less to me. That's less of a it's less of a, a thing. But this is this is a stimulus I've seen before, um, which means they may roll it out again. I think I think it's kind of due at this point. But um, just look at tables carefully. Be sure you see what information is provided in the table. Um, ask yourself if the rate actually corresponds to the amount of water. Like for example, this table is a table of a rate of a rate out, right? And so you're not getting all of the picture uh, corresponding to what's actually happening in the function uh, and what's happening in the volume, for example. So there's a lot of information that's going un unsaid here. Okay, you do have to watch out for keywords like twice differentiable. Um, increasing is increasing is kind of cool here. Although I think the reason that they said G is strictly increasing here is only, it turns out, I think now only to justify that G has an inverse. It's 1022. I think it is probably time for everybody to get some rest. So let me just thank you guys for coming. So cool to see everybody coming out. Um, I mean, we are close to the exam, so I, and I, I get it, but you know, to still take your evening and spend a little time thinking about tables and problems with me is great. And I've had a lot of fun this year. Um, you know, we're, we're going to pull through this together, you guys. So thanks a lot. Take care.